The meaning of a message is not in how it's delivered, whether it's read or heard or felt. What matters is not how we write it or how we send it, but rather that we can. Donate now to help give someone's words wings. for changes in law so that the people standing before us today can get the benefit of the things that you are working so hard to have. We reject all the apartheid laws that are so, so much selective to, to disability people, particularly the blind, in particular the, the challenges that we have now with the, the publication and so on and so on. We can fight for access for the blind and low-income individuals without disadvantaging artists and writers. We can build our TV and movie production industries without denying actors royalties and rights. In fact, progressive copyright and IP laws are key to building all our sectors of society and, we, and uh, making sure that we don't push down people in the long run. We gather here on this historic day when Blind SA supported by Section 27, and all of us is taking our government to the highest courts in the land. Power to the people, Amanda. The job of Section 27 as a public interest organization is to assist clients experiencing injustice to assess if the injustices are human rights violations and to build cases to remedy the human rights violations. We guide our clients in building campaigns to support their cases. We have struggled long enough for our rights. We want our rights now. We demand our rights. Amandla. Amawetu. Amandla. It was a revolution. Some call it a struggle. I paid a heavy price. Our goal was equality. Some say we won the war. I say we are still fighting a book famine and apartheid copyright laws that refuse to transform. If that is what human rights looks like, I can't see it. There was a time when South Africans stood together to demand change. We stood together for equality, justice and freedom. When it's a crime to transcribe books into Braille, freedom hasn't come far enough. Blind people experience a book famine. Sighted people don't. When a blind person's rights are affected like this, justice hasn't come far enough. It's time to stand together again. It's time to demand change. I think the message there is Braille is not a crime. And that is the whole purpose of the case, was to give an exemption from our copyright laws to people with visual disabilities. Um, I'm not going to talk about the substance of this case. Uh, we have specialized lawyers here who will do that, and the activists that have been directly involved in the case that will talk about it. Uh, but before I hand over to them, I want to just mention, talk about three things, and it's three things that are very important when you build a public interest law case. 
I believe there was a lot of talk yesterday about litigation. Um, and, you know, we don't just bring cases. We talk about legal mobilization. And litigation is just one of the strategies that we may use in a case. And when we use litigation, um, these are some of the factors that we look for for a case to be successful. So I just, and that were very present in uh, the blind essay case, and which was why it was a successful case to run. So the first thing I want to talk about is the timing of a public interest case. Could we have brought the blind essay case um, in, 20, in, in 2010? I don't think so. And this is why. Um, as many of you know, or may know, is that Section 27 was involved in the Limpopo textbook litigation um, that started in 2008. And that litigation was about um, learners in Limpopo hadn't received any textbooks. And we went to court and the judge said, textbooks are part of the right to basic education and every learner is entitled to a textbook. We then brought a similar case for learners in blind schools and that case uh, was settled. Uh, but one of the things that was acknowledged in that case is that blind learners also have the right to a textbook. There were also other cases that said uh, learners with disabilities are entitled to their right to basic education. So there were a whole lot of these cases where there was a jurisprudence that developed a good foundation for us to build on when it came to copyright. We call this incrementalism, and I'll talk, talk about this a little bit more. And then we understood the way we do when we deal with, uh, when we build cases, that when we put down one brick for a case on top of the foundation, there's always scope to expand the law to ensure that more people get access to textbooks. And this is what we were interested on, in. And on that basis, I then attended uh, a lecture given by my person, this person on the left, who was then a doctoral candidate and who spoke about her doctoral research. Uh, I was interested in the aspects dealing with the ways in which copyright impedes the right to education. A few months later, we were approached by Blind SA. And Blind SA came to us and they said, do we know how we can use the law to get government to ratify the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, and it's very hard to use litigation to get government, who's the executive, to do something. And that's because of something called the separation of powers. They all act independently of each other. So instead, we went to our uh, we went to a, 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 a lawyer that we've worked with before, and that's an intellectual property specialist, and we debated and we talked, and we came up with a strategy. And our strategy was this. Don't worry about, um, let's, let's, let's not go there yet. Instead, what we should do is let's challenge the 1978 Act that doesn't give an exemption to people with visual disabilities. We can't force government to sign the Marrakesh Treaty until the CAB is completed, but we can challenge this act. Specifically, the absence of an exemption for persons with visual disabilities. Because of this, they can't access books that others can, resulting in the book famine we heard about. Um, also, there are civil and criminal consequences if people infringe the Copyright Act. So this was a clear case of discrimination for people with disabilities. Then the second thing we look at is something called the low-hanging fruit and incrementalism. So if people follow the cases and things that have happened in our society, reforms, you'll know that there have been a couple of major reforms that have happened in our society around marriage equality for same-sex couples and uh, access to antiretrovirals. These were not things that happened overnight. Rather, they were slow cases where we first, for example, challenged 
the lack of access to benefits of the same-sex couple from the other couple before we went to marriage equality. So that rather than one big case saying gay people must be allowed to get married, we build the foundation to get there. It's a steady chipping away at an issue. We start with the best facts and the strongest law. In this case, we couldn't reform the entire Copyright Act in one fell swoop using litigation. It's very complex. And each facet of the Copyright Act would have different uh, legal and rights implications. And building a case within the constraints of legal procedure is also very impossible. So we look at a case one, one legal point at a time, basically. Supporting people with visual disabilities was the low-hanging fruit. They are clearly a vulnerable group. And like I said, there was clear and direct discrimination in this case. It was easy to start here, to start chipping away at the copyright, uh, the current Copyright Act that's referred to as an apartheid act, which was around since 1978. The third thing that we had in this case, and which is very necessary in every case, that not necessary in every case, but when you leading a huge um, mobilization like this, is that you have to have a very active, empowered movement or organization who's able to use the law to support their broader campaign. Litigation, as I said, is just one tactic in a broader campaign. In this case, Blind SA was able to take their issue and translate it into the language of rights, discrimination, uh, freedom of expression violation, violation of the right to education. They were also able to create public awareness around this case using videos, interviews, op-eds, marches. We just saw a package of that. And as someone that's been in the public interest world for over 20 years, and who has worked with the likes of the Treatment Action Campaign, I can tell you it is a complete joy to work with Blind SA because they are one of the most empowered organizations and clients, often with law and the peop and public interest law and the people we serve. Um, there's often lawyers that are in charge. I can tell you with Jace, we are never in charge. They know the law, they tell us, they brief us, and, as, and, and, and they tell us how they would like to run the case. And our job is to tell them what is and is not possible. It is not a case in Blind SA where the lawyers are schooling the clients. It's very much the other way around. And as I said, it's been such an honor and a tremendous learning curve for us. Um, and there's always a respectful engagement and partnership between us and Blind SA. So that is how we built the case. And now I'm going to start handing over to people that will be talking about the case itself. The first person is going to be Christu. And as always, I am very impressed with people in Blind SA when I just hear about how much they've done. Christu is a qualified lawyer who has practiced as an advocate at the Cape Town Bar until 79. He then went on and became a computer programmer and has worked at Standard Bank and EPSA. In 1974, he became involved in Blind SA, then known as the South African Blind Workers Organization. And he was a founding men, uh, member of the Peninsula Branch in Cape Town. He has been an active member in Blind SA since then working mainly in the fields of Braille, IT, and accessibility, more specifically with our copyright struggle. In 2020, in 2020 he became uh, the vice president of Blind SA. And today he's going to be talking to us about barriers uh, to blind persons um, on the right to research. So without further ado, Christo, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Farnaz, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'm not going to talk much legalese to you, 
more from the other part of my life, more techy stuff. Um, the background to my talk today is on the right to research, that blind people have the right to research like anyone else has. But there are barriers in the way of us realizing this right to research. We're going to look at some of those barriers and what we have been doing to overcome them. Research involves very much reading. Now there's our first issue. I mentioned yesterday that 0.5% of publications in South Africa are available to blind persons in accessible format. Then our right to material was further restricted by the Unconstitutional Act of 1978. Fortunately, that obstacle got out of the way on the 21st of September last year with a Concord judgment. So that's one down, but we still have issues. We mentioned that the major part of research is reading. How do blind people read? You'll see on the next slide, I have four potential ways in which a blind person can do his reading research. He could use Braille. He could use a living person to do his reading for, for him. He can get a human being to read and make recordings. Or the blind person could use TTS. We'll quickly go through the next few slides slides which uh, deal with each of these individually. On the next slide, we will talk about Braille. Now, Braille is essential to us. Braille is a, as they say in law, sine qua non. You, you know, it's, it's non-negotiable. But is it actually the most effective way to do research? We have certain challenges with Braille. The one is, it is very costly to, to produce. The other one is, it takes a long time to produce Braille. Braille is bulky. Storage of Braille can be an issue. Now, very often when you do research, time is of the essence. So, you know, you cannot, you do not have the luxury of spending a long time to create your Braille material. So Braille would not be ideal for uh, serious research uh, in most cases. On the next uh, slide, we will look at uh, using a human reader. It could cost money. The person might want money for it. Reading through someone else is always a bit of a challenge. Um, also, finding suitable times could be a, a serious a drawback. And then also, confidentiality might become an issue. So, if you have to do it that way, do it, but also it's not ideal. The next slide, we look at getting a human to make a recording. Now, most of what applies to using a, a sighted reader applies here also, but it has some additional issues. The researcher will have to wait for the recordings to be uh, finished first, which could take some time. But more seriously, the researcher does not have access to the text. The researcher has access to a recording, so you do not have access to spelling of unfamiliar names uh, or words uh, or layout, punctuation, that sort of thing. So it is not possible to make accurate quotations. So also not ideal. Now we're going to look in more detail from the next slide on, where we're going to look at TTS or text to speech. TTS stands for text to speech. It is 
a computer software which analyzes text and then uh, through a preset rules for the particular language enables the computer to generate speech of whatever the user needs spoken, whatever text is sent to what we call the TTS engine. The, re uh, the researcher um, would use a program called a screen reader, which in turn uses the TTS engine. A screen reader speaks to the user exactly what happens on the computer screen. Text that appears, controls, whether checkboxes are checked or not, that sort of thing. The big benefit of TTS is the material is immediately available. You don't have to wait for it, have it converted first. It is very cost effective because there are very good screen readers that are free. Another benefit is the user has access to the words themselves. The user has access to spelling, uh, punctuation, layout, and therefore can also make accurate quotations. Because uh, it is, it's data, storage is never an issue. But it is not the golden bullet. On the next screen, I have the title, There is more to eat than meets the ear. There are issues with screen readers or using screen readers for research. One is, please bury this in your memory, PDF documents most of the time are a nightmare to blind people. Many PDF documents are image PDFs, they are scanned documents. Screen readers can't read those. When they are not uh, image PDFs, very often if they contain graphs or tables, those tables get, get mangled in such a way by the screen reader software, which in most cases is not intelligent enough to figure out how the tables fit together, that the information gathered from the tables does not make sense to the user, which makes that useless for a researcher. Now we get to a more serious issue. Currently, there's TTS for English. That is very good. There's, there are many TTS engines for English which are very good, but there is no reasonably usable TTS in our local languages. Having said that, let me mention that the uh, uh, Maraca Institute of the CSIR did develop TTS engines for all our local languages. We looked at them, we wanted to use them for the TTS component of uh, the material we were producing at Blind SA, but our users found them not usable. They couldn't understand what these were saying. Now, a problem we have also is that English texts, South African texts, contain very many uh, portions in other local languages, names of places or quotations, and that creates a serious problem for a TTS. An English TTS will analyze according to English pronunciation rules. Blind SA produced uh, the book Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton in electronic format, in a format called DAISY. DAISY is an acronym, acronym for Digital um, Accessible Information System, which is based on, on PDF, uh, not PDF, crazy, it's based on EPUB, um, with accessibility features added 
to the, to the EPUB. Now, the opening sentence of that book talks about a town in KZN called Ikopo. It's spelled I-X-O-B-O, -O, Ikopo. Applying English pronunciation rules, our TTS pronounces it Ixobo because it does not contain the, 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 the phonemes for other languages. TTS engines uh, often have the ability to switch language. Well, you can't switch to another language if you don't have a TTS for that language, but as I will explain later, for the modern TTS engines, recording of human voices are, are, are used in the creation of those languages, which means that if the TTS comes across a word in another language, it's suddenly pronounced in a different voice. So that is really dis uh, distracting when you're reading. Now, I, I hope there are some software engineers listening to some of this because these are still issues that, that need to be sorted out, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Now, what Blind Essay has done about this in the meantime is that we decided to embark on a project to create high-quality TTS for our local languages, but because of the cost involved, because of the capacity to find people to do that, we've identified three languages to try and start off with. We decided to uh, have TTS developed for Isi Zulu, for Setswana, and for Afrikaans. We are in uh, negotiations with two developers, the one is a blind software engineer in Sweden who has experience of developing TTS. He's developed TTS for English and for Swedish, and he's very keen to get cracking with the Isi Zulu. And we are ready now to go, to give him the go ahead to start with the Isi Zulu. We are in negotiations also with a blind software engineer from uh, a unit called Louder Pages uh, in Canada, uh, not Canada, in California. Um, he is going to do the Setswana for us, and then we still need to sort out issues about the Afrikaans. Now, we're going to look at the creation of the TTS, uh, what it involves. First of all, the cost is 50,000 Rand per language. Um, you'll see on the uh, screen there when we page what the steps are involved. I won't go through them now uh, for saving some time, but it, it is a huge process that, that we're involved in. Let me conclude on the last page by uh, giving you some samples of TTS. My name is Sven. I was created by Microsoft. Hi, let me introduce myself. I am Sam's sister Mary, and my voice sucks as bad as his. Hello, I am newer than my cousins, Mary and Sam, but my voice still sucks. My name is Anna. Hello, I am Crystal from at and I am SAPI 5 voice, an improvement over SAPI 4 voices I think. Hello everyone, I am Crystal's big brother Mike, I am another voice from at and Hey, wait, you have not heard me yet. I'm Tessa, lovely South African lady and you can find me on Windows computers and iPhones. Let me then just conclude by saying the first one um, shows how the TTS have evolved over the uh, 
past two or more decades, uh, they've become more natural sounding. The second is a short clip um, done in Afrikaans by a TTS engine called eSpeak, which is open source and it is free. It is a very accurate pronunciation, uh, but the sound of it is not acceptable to people because it is electronically generated. It does not contain any human voice. The benefit of that one is it can uh, seamlessly uh, switch between languages and, and speak the different languages in the same voice. But unfortunately, you don't want to hear the voice. And then the third clip was just a bit of, of, of fun. That is a sound clip of somebody who had too much time on hand, used a deck talk synthesizer to, to sing a song by Queen. Our next presenter is um, Dr. Claudia Janssen van Rensburg, um, and she is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Chair for Identities and Social Cohesion in Africa, uh, based at the Nelson Mandela University. She completed a PhD in musicology at uh, Stellenbosch University in 2017 under the supervision of Prof. Stephanus Miller and Prof. Thomas Cousins. Her recent research interests include music and settler colonialism, as well as music and intellectual property. And she will be speaking to us today about accessing the right to research Reflections on Copyright and Visual Impairment. Over to you. Okay, great. Am I audible? Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to... Okay. Um... Thank you for the nice introduction, by the way. Um, so in the last number of years, South African universities have witnessed student protest and unrest that have called for the falling of statues, radical transformation, and the decolonization of the curriculum. Because of the lingering legacies of race as a form of exclusion and discrimination within university and in institutional spaces, Race has been at the forefront of many discussions. It is perhaps not surprising then that the subject of disability has often been overlooked. A silence, as Leslie Swartz, Jason Bonches, Heidi Lawrence, and Brian Watermeyer suggest, is its own version of effacement. However, and I quote, as soon as there is a discussion about race in South Africa, they cannot, the authors argue, at some level be a discussion of disability, because the colonized were constituted as disabled for being intellectually inferior. In other words, the, sub the subject of disability is not separate from the prominent discussions of race and on the decolonial project, but part of it. The premise that staff and students with disabilities at higher educational institutions in South Africa exist in a tenuous and challenging space is supported by a wide body of literature. These challenges relate to issues of inclusion and equal access that is significantly hindered by copyright. And this is to say nothing of the alignment of disability policies at South African universities with implementation and practice. Whilst intellectual property is a comparatively recent field in law, understandings of property and ownership are naturally tainted by South Africa's settler colonial past and internationally accepted legal principles that pertain to copyright. In turn, the democratization of knowledge and the archive may be connected to recent debates in legal circles on the decolonization of law. I was an undergraduate music student at the University of Pretoria um, and a doctoral candidate at Stellenbosch University in musicology. And we had a lot to say about Stellenbosch University yesterday. As well as a current, and I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Nelson Mandela University um, and have done some lecturing at Stellenbosch University music department. For the past two years, I've been reading towards an LLB degree through the Un University of South Africa. So I have a fairly good idea, I think, of what is happening at 
various dis universities in terms of, uni in terms of disability. Um, I find myself in a unique, although not isolated, position of ap appreciating the need for copyright to generate revenue for performers and creators, and the simultaneous need and right to access copyrighted material with the same freedom as those around me. In short, I explore the access to the right to research in South Africa by visually in impaired researchers. It is worth noting that these constraints are not merely a frustration and often laborious avenue to access, but they impact on research and methodology itself. Arjun Apadurai argues that the right to research is a right of a particular kind that should be recognized as a more universal and elementary ability and not only as an activity carried out by high-end um, high experts and university academics. He suggests that research is a, special, is a specialized name for, quote, the things we need to know but do not know yet, unquote, and that it is vital to the exercise of informed citizenship. In the context of globalization, the right to research and indeed access to that right becomes particularly valuable and ephemeral. In turn, a Padurai posits that it is, the right, it, it is a right that ought to be sought by less affluent sectors of society to gain strategic knowledge and as a claim to de democratic citizenship. In the interests of performing citizenship, the right to research requires democratization of knowledge and access to that knowledge for visually impaired, um, that visually impaired persons um, has proved to be consider considerable barriers, I apologize, not least because of copyright. In my own research process, and I'm referring mainly to my current research and my doctoral research, the most obvious difficulty has been accessing secondary literature that is not available in digital formats. In my experience, university disability departments are often better prepared to assist students with undergraduate work, such as lecture notes and prescribed reading materials provided in advance by lecturing staff. However, once I reached postgraduate level, I was required to read far more broadly for my research. This meant more trips to the university library and the need to access an archive of knowledge that was not always prepared digitally. Um, prepared digitally, including primary sources, which presented a series of unique problems that I will not engage with today. In such cases, and when attempts to contact publishers and authors to attain digital copies failed, gaining access was possible through laboriously scanning texts so that they can be read by screen readers, such as the ones discussed by Christo just now. Until recently, this was, however, in contravention of the 1978 Copyright Act. The Act, as many here present will be aware, prohibits the reproduction of copyrighted material without the explicit consent of the copyright holder. This is a difficult prov um, provision to adhere to for practical reasons, and it places ind individuals in something of an ethically challenging paradox, in which exercising the right to research, as a Padurai puts it, and education is only possible through the contravention of the law. Although this particular restriction has been relaxed in recent months, and as several presentations during the course of this conference have shown, there is still consider a considerable amount of relief that needs to be granted, notably in the signing of the Marrakesh Treaty and the ratification of the Copyright Amendment Bill. It is worth considering, too, the specifics of software used by many blind and partially sighted individuals to read, write, and navigate a computer. Some of this software, uh, for example, applications such as JAWS, ZoomText, Window Eyes, Fusion, and Open Book require either a personal or institutional license that is economically unattainable for many individuals around the world. And so it is perhaps not surprising that there are several pirated versions in circulation. Fortunately, this situation is changing and open access solutions are being made available. In some cases, accessibility solutions are built into many smartphones and operating systems, for example, Android and iOS. What remains unfortunate, despite the Constitutional Court ruling, which found the 1978 Act unconstitutional, is that a number of publishers, particularly academic publishers, require readers to read digital copies of their publications in the publisher's own application. 
In most cases, an accessibility option is available and built into the application. But my experience in utilizing these solutions has been disappointing compared with the software I have already mentioned. For the, furthermore, pricing for digital copies is, in the case of two publishers I have encountered, in fact above the price of the hard copy format, and access to digital copy of the work is granted only for a limited time. This is problematic because of economic, the economic e impact on students and researchers who are unable to buy secondhand books or access hard copies through university libraries. Of course, it must be acknowledged, as some publishers have been at pains to point out to me, that all students are, and researchers are expected to buy books regardless of disability. A requirement which is in itself a significant challenge for students in South Africa and the Global South. However, very few students are in a position to buy um, all their books new from publishers or in ebook format at the current premium rate. The debate surrounding the price of academic resources and textbooks is of course not only applicable to visually impaired individuals, but also those from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. The practical implications of this debate, that is the balancing of interests between publishers and students, undoubtedly requires urgent attention. But the point I wish to make here is that many disabled students are from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. In fact, as a significant body of literature demonstrates, there is a pervasive correlation between poverty and disability that exceeds the scope of this paper. In turn, this model effectively dictates that dis disabled students and researchers pay a premium rate for the material they access, and it not only controls the length of that access, but also exactly how text is engaged with on a practical level. This point is significant to me because not all approaches um, by visually impaired individuals to reading material is the same. Indeed, not all disabilities are the same, and therefore some individuals prefer to convert their reading material into braille, some prefer large print, some prefer screen readers, etc. In turn, it is an approach to accessibility that, in my view, retains something of a paternalistic character that is thinly veiled in a disingenuous rhetoric of inclusivity. A degree of resolution to some of the challenges mentioned can be attained through projects such as Bookshare. Bookshare is an online library specifically intended for users who are visually impaired or have print disabilities. What is particularly useful about this site is that it allows registered users to convert text into a range of accessible formats, depending on their needs. It is therefore an important tool in accessing reading material for visually impaired researchers. A challenge that remains, however, is that Bookshare is bound to providing resources to users in their own particular country and abide, ab abiding related copyright restrictions. In the case of South Africa, and because the Marrakesh Treaty has not yet been signed, the range of titles, particularly academic titles, available on Bookshare is quite limited. In turn, the urge to turn to resources such as Library Genesis is still not eradicated. Perhaps one of the greatest difficulties in writing this presentation has been that it um, has very little new to say on the status of disability rights and access in institutions of high learning in South Africa. So why, one may ask, another paper on disability and access? The answer to this question is a simple one. For as long as barriers and equal access to knowledge for disabled individuals endure, their grievances will linger and it will remain an imperative for activists to agitate for change. Mark Fisher, who writes in the context of the repetitive condition of culture, i.e. the absence of anything really new in the fields of art, music and film, refers to what he terms the slow cancellation of the future. This condition, Fisher tells us, is accompanied by a deflation of, ex of expectations. To transfer this logic to the subject of my presentation, the relative status and reassertion of rhetoric to provide access to the visually impaired is repeated time and time again. The future is cancelled. And as long as the future is cancelled, this conversation will continue to endure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was extremely interesting. Um, I wish we had access to your paper when we were uh, trying to get across to Justice Unterhalter 
what the issues of access would be, particularly to secondary works, as you suggest, and also adaptation and what adaptation means in different contexts. Um, so yes, uh, yes, another disability paper, but I think uh, very, very useful for those of us that um, are struggling to communicate this to judges, and maybe you'll be doing that one day when you finish your LLB. Um, yeah, and also the cross-border sharing, I definitely think is the next frontier for us. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our next speaker, um, who is Sanya Samtani. And she is a senior researcher at the Mandela Institute at Wits University. And she also served as the most competent and knowledgeable academic advisor to our copyright uh, case. Um, and her commitment, because she was terribly underpaid, um, is forever recognized by me. Sanya completed her PhD uh, at the University of Oxford in 2021. And as I said, it is the source of the, her, this, uh, the, her research is what was highly influen influential um, in our case. Her doctoral research focused on the intersection of copyright and human rights in international and domestic law in respect of access to educational materials. Um, and there is nobody better to speak to us on the case and the implications of the judgment for people with visual and print disabilities in South Africa. So over to you, Sonia. Thank you, Farinaz, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, I must say that it has been such a privilege to work with Blind SA in Section 27, um, and I have enjoyed it immensely, and I hope that I can continue to do that, because really this is one of the great joys of, of my career so far. Um, so the title of my presentation, uh, and this also forms the title of a forthcoming paper, um, is Recognizing and Remedying Copyright Discrimination. And it really is a commentary on the blind essay litigation. Um, in particular, I'll focus on the implications today. So we've already heard quite directly from uh, the speakers before me exactly what the problem is in respect of accessible format shifting. And it's egregious. It's uh, shocking. It's really just um, unconscionable that this is this has been allowed to exist on uh, this has been allowed the law in this way has been allowed to exist um, since the dawn of democracy uh, in South Africa, which contains within its constitution a strong anti discrimination provision and several rights in the Bill of Rights. So it, uh, the judgment that uh, the constitutional court delivered in September 2022 is, is long overdue. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background uh, and then I'm going to move into the specific rulings and what they mean. Um, so this will be legal, but I'm going to try and explain uh, in a way that it appeals to everyone. Um, we've already talked about the book famine. Um, Christo said that less than 0.5% of published works are accessible in formats um, uh, that uh, are accessible to people living with print and visual disabilities in South Africa. The converse of that is that 99.5% of works are inaccessible and that the market of published works is catering specifically to people without disabilities and that itself is discriminatory. Um, but that's, that's a different story and it's a matter for a different case maybe or a matter for specifically quite a lot of advocacy and campaigning. Um, and really here, um, the background, so we, we talk about the book famine and then we also know that South Africa has publicly stated its intention to ratify the Marrakesh Treaty um, that specifically um, creates uh, obligations on states' parties to introduce in its law uh, provisions for accessible format shifting as well as cross-border exchange of accessible works. Um, South Africa has not yet ratified the Marrakesh Treaty, as Claudia said. Um, Parliament has stated an intention to ratify as soon as the process of copyright reform domestically is complete. That takes me then to the Copyright Amendment Bill. So we've been talking around it for the past two days. Um, Christo's presentation yesterday was really helpful, really set out what the bill um, is going to do for people with disabilities. Um, 
And what we focus, what sort of, there are a few provisions that relate to people with disabilities. There's section 19D, which you'll hear me talk about a lot, because that also was part of the relief that Blind SA sought in the litigation. Um, but then there are also the provisions on technological uh, protection measures and uh, anti-circumvention of TPMs. And really that's something that's still, that's still in the cab. Uh, submissions are still open to Parliament, and I'll talk a little bit about how that also limits um, accessible format shifting. Um, so Blind SA, as Christo said yesterday, litigated initially to compel the President to act uh, because the bill had been already passed by the National Assembly and was sitting on his desk. And then um, after Blind SA's initial litigation, uh, the President sent the bill back, but there's widely documented information that shows that the President was in fact under geopolitical pressure from the EU and the US to send it back. Um, so, after the cab returned to the National Assembly, it remained in the National Assembly for two years, uh, at which point Blind SA uh, initiated, with, with uh, Section 27 as their representatives, initiated litigation on the basis of this inordinate delay, because the longer the cab was taking in Parliament, um, the book famine was continuing, and as you've all heard, um, how that looks. Um, so that brings us then to the Pretoria High Court uh, in 2021. Um, the matter was, uh, so I'll talk about the applicants first. Uh, there's, some of them are sitting here. So we had four deponents uh, with visual and print disabilities. Jay Snyer, the head of Blind SA, um, a former constitutional court judge. Uh, some of you might know Zach Yacoub. Um, a novelist and a PhD researcher, uh, Marcus Lowe, and a school teacher um, who's teaching uh, students with disabilities. The respondents were the Minister for Trade, Industry and Competition, who introduced the CAB, so that's why they were the first respondents. There were the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation, because as Farina said, this concerned the Marrakesh VIP Treaty, maybe not directly, because we were looking at domestic law reform, but definitely indirectly, uh, because as Claudia was talking about Bookshare, um, I'll get to that. It also included the President and Parliament, so really all of government. You can see that they were the respondents. We also had Amiki, so we had the International Commission of Jurists come in. Uh, we had Media Monitoring Africa come in, um, and this was at the High Court level. So at the High Court level, the matter was completely unopposed. So none of the, gov the government didn't respond. Uh, rather, they responded, but they said they would abide by the court's decision, and that just meant that um, they did not oppose in substance the relief that Blind SA was seeking. They did not oppose. The framing uh, of blind SEO, the key allegation that the Copyright Act discriminated unfairly against people with visual and print disabilities um, on the basis of uh, the requirement of authorization of the copyright owner for accessible format shifting. Um, and Justice Mbongwe then um, handed down judgment, uh, basically holding that the act was unconstitutional and that interim section 19D uh, was to be read in until parliament finalizes the cab. Um, and Justice Mbongwe extended this to all works and to all disabilities. He didn't focus only on people with visual and print disabilities. But as a matter of standard constitutional procedure, this went up to the Constitutional Court um, because it was a declaration of invalidity of a provision in the Act or a series of provisions in the Act, and the Con Court needed to confirm that or not. At the Con Court level, also, the matter remained unopposed. So um, the Minister. Um, so everyone, all of the four respondents responded uh, to say they would abide by the court's decision. They did not oppose Blind SA's um, arguments regarding the fact that the rights to dignity, equality, education, participation in cultural life, and freedom of expression were violated. Um, uh, the Minister for Trade, Industry, and Competition had counsel there uh, to clarify any questions that the court had. Um, and the amici were uh, the International Commission of Jurists, Media Monitoring Africa, and a third amicus, Owen Dean, uh, who's a retired professor from Stellenbosch University, um, writing on copyright law. Uh, he also put in an application to um, be joined as an amicus. Uh, similarly, like I said, the matter remained unopposed. Everyone agreed that the Copyright Act unfairly discriminated against blind SA, people with visual and print disabilities, and that the act was unconstitutional to the extent to which it limited the applicant's rights in the Bill of Rights. Um, so 
What did the court do? The court did two things. It first recognized that there was copyright discrimination, and then it sought to remedy that copyright discrimination. So the judgment uh, by Acting Justice Unterhalter was a unanimous one. Uh, it, the court unanimously recognized that the operation of the Copyright Act indeed drastically restricted access to published works, people with visual and print disabilities. This, the court held, was borne out by the evidence before it that demonstrated the hardship caused by the requirement of authorization of the copyright owner in order for people with visual and print disabilities to convert works into formats accessible. Importantly, the court made very clear that the effect of the copyright owner being unreachable or uncontactable was exactly the same as a copyright holder declining a request for authorization. And the court also understood that this impacted heavily on the constitutional rights of people with visual and print disabilities. Now, this was, of course, in contrast to people without disabilities not needing to fulfill this requirement of authorization. Um, the court engaged in an unfair discrimination analysis. Um, in particular, the court acknowledged that people with print and visual disabilities suffer from a scarcity of access to literary works that people without these impairments do not. Um, and in particular, the judgment reads, uh, the result is that people with visual and print disabilities are denied access um, to the majority of the works on the basis of their disability. So that is flagrant unfair discrimination. It violates Section 9 of the Constitution. Um, and the ruling, importantly, turns on the requirement of authorization of the copyright holder. Um, similarly, with regard to the Bill of Rights analysis, the rights to dignity, the right to freedom to receive and impart information, the right to participate in cultural life and the right to education were also held to be violated on the basis, again, of the requirement of authorization of the copyright owner. Now, the scope of the judgment was limited to literary and artistic works um, and also limited to people with visual and print disabilities. Now, this does not mean that there's an adverse ruling with regard to people with other disabilities across the spectrum or with regard to other works. Rather, the court held that this was the case before it, these were the applicants before it, and these were the examples that were provided to the court, which is why the court confined its ruling to uh, visual and print disabilities and to literary and artistic works. Um, the implications of this are, though, that it sets important precedent to extend the application of the judgment to people with other disabilities across the spectrum, facing similar forms of discrimination or analogous forms of discrimination as well as people living in poverty, children in education, and other vulnerable groups, like refugees and asylum seekers as well, who are prevented from exercising their rights in the Bill of Rights on the basis of this specific requirement of authorization. So really looking at the CAB and the provision that deals with technological protection measures, there's one provision that says um, if people would like to use, would like to circumvent technological protection measures, that is, um, unlock, digital lock, for the purpose of exercising an exception and limitation in, in the Copyright Act or in the CAB as it will be after it's passed, um, they must seek the authorization of the copyright owner. Um, now, obviously, uh, one may put in submissions regarding that, uh, but it's evidently clear that the Constitutional Court um, considered that this requirement of authorization had a discriminatory effect. So that must be considered when analyzing that provision as well. Uh, moving back to the judgment, the judgment is, of course, in no uncertain terms, a complete win for people with disabilities. Uh, it's the first judgment of the Constitutional Court to deal with copyright issues at all. Um, the co copyright issues have otherwise been dealt with by high courts. Um, um, but this is the first judgment of the Constitutional Court, the highest court in South Africa. Um, now, the second thing that the judgment did was remedy this copyright discrimination. And there were two remedies that the court had before it. The first was blind essay and Section 27's proposal that um, the court should read in CAB's proposed Section 19D. Um, and of course, Section 19D, as it was um, at the time at which uh, the bill was at the National Assembly, it's now in the NCOP, but at the time at which it was in the National Assembly, um, the first few words of it uh, of, of Section 19D implied that um, specific entities would have to be prescribed by regulation in order for 19D accessible format shifting to take place. Now, um, that requirement was something that Blind SA suggested 
a slight modification to in the interest of justice because the court has that power according to the constitution. Um, and then there was, so the minister didn't counter propose anything, uh, but Owen Dean, as I mentioned, a copyright academic who is the third amicus, um, proposed that the court direct rather the minister to promulgate regulations under section 13 of the Copyright Act instead. But, um, and as Farnas was talking about the difference between adaptation and reproduction, the court considered that remedy to be too restrictive because the court held that it would requ require regulations under section 13 that are limited to only making copies uh, and that would not take into account the full a basket of the different modifications and adaptations that would have to be made for people with disabilities across the spectrum. Um, and so ad it, what was required for accessible format shifting, the court held, was more than mere reproduction. It also included adaptation. Uh, with regard to blind essays proposal to read in section 19D, the court held that what, what people with visual and print disabilities need is immediate address. And section 19D, by requiring ministerial regulation for it to be operational, did not fulfill that, um, because that would then lead to a further delay. Um, the court then decided to use the Marrakesh VIP Treaty as a framework to create its own remedy, uh, which was a very interesting move on the court's part. Um, of course, the crafting of a remedy is uh, of a sort of reading in legislative remedy is not new in South Africa. This is something that happens routinely to cure unconstitutionalities. Um, but really using an unratified treaty like the Marrakesh Treaty to do that, that was something that was a bit new. But what the court did was um, it drew on specific provisions in the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, and I will tell you now what section 13A, the court's remedy says. Um, so really the court defines an accessible copy and an accessible copy is uh, the copy of a work in an alternative manner or form which gives a beneficiary person access to the work. So again, this leaves it completely open. So as Claudia was saying, like people, people might have preferences as to what they would, what they would, how they would like to access work. And that's just like, I prefer a hard copy book to an e-book. Similarly, maybe Claudia prefers her iPad to Braille. That's, you know, that sort of treats people with disabilities with the same sort of respect and dignity um, that we consider people without disabilities. Uh, thanks, I'm almost done. Um, including, so the definition continues, including to permit the person to have access as feasibly and comfortably as a person without visual impairment. So really we're not, this is sort of broader than a kind of prescriptive, people with visual disabilities can only use a specific type. Um, second, a benefit, the definition of a beneficiary person, that is a person with visual disabilities, was again taken from the Marrakesh Treaty, includes someone who's blind, visually impaired, someone who has a perceptual or reading disability which cannot be improved uh, to be like a sighted person, someone who has a physical disability which prevents them from holding or handling a book to enable effective reading. So this is important because the court judgment, although it's widely reported to deal only with people with visual disabilities, it actually also includes people with physical disabilities who cannot manipulate a book. So for, think someone with Parkinson's, for example, um, and also someone who has a physical disability which prevents them from focusing or moving the eyes to enable effective reading. Now, there's also a definition of a permitted entity, and this is similar to the idea of an authorized entity in the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, again, the definition is taken from the Marrakesh Treaty, and that's an inclusive definition so that the minister does not have to promulgate a list of authorized entities. That is not what the court says is required. The court simply says that a permitted entity is a government institution or a non-profit, like Line SA, whose main activities include education, training, adaptive reading, or information access. Um, what's important is that it's a non-profit basis and, um, as, uh, and also that the work that they do, uh, the accessible format shifting that they do focuses only, uh, is for the end user of a person with a disability. Um, so you'll be able to read more about that in the guide that um, has been launched today because there's a very clear plain language explanation for what the court said and what the implications of that judgment are and who can use the judgment to gain access. Um, and finally, the implications of 
the judgment for the ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty. Now, um, technically, uh, it is now possible for South Africa to ratify the treaty. Cross-border exchange, this is because Section 23 of the Act talks, that talks about infringement talks about secondary infringement as well as primary infringement. So for example, where a work is no longer an infringing work, it's rendered legal, trading in that work is no longer an infringement. So for the lawyers in the room, if you want to look at Section 23.2, you can, because that's the one that deals with this. The guide explains that in more detail. And I'll conclude with this. So the court judgment, for those of you who've looked at it or for those of you who've read about it, they have, the court has issued a declaration of suspended invalidity. Now, what does that mean? Effectively, that means that um, although, um, well, I'll read a quote from the judgment because that's, that's probably the most uh, sort of telling point. The starting point is this. Persons with print and visual disabilities should not have to wait further to secure a remedy. So even though it says suspended invalidity, that does not mean that the invalidity, like that, that, that particular um, effect of the judgment is suspended. That, that's not what that means. Um, the parliamentary process has already taken too long, says the court. The need to address the infringement of rights is pressing. There must be a remedy granted that provides immediate redress. However, parliament must be afforded an opportunity to cure the constitutional defect that we have found to exist. So really the court has created a remedy, as I told you, 13A, which is read into the act to make accessible format shifting legal now, or rather as of the date of the judgment, the 21st of September, 2022. But the court also gave parliament two years from that date to say, if you can finalize the cab specifically with regard to 19D, specifically with regard to people with disabilities, you must do so within the next two years. That's why it's suspended, to protect separation of powers. Um, with regard to Parliament's uh, sort of discretion, uh, se Section 13A, the court crafted remedy, acts as a sort of floor, which means that that's not the ceiling. Section 13A is not um, a sort of a limitation on what Parliament can do to better, um, better respond to this unconstitutionality. Parliament still has discretion to do so, which means that the second part of Section 19D that deals with a clear framework for cross-border exchange of works would be helpful because as Claudia described, there have been difficulties with trying to convince Bookshare, Accessible Books Consortium, etc., cetera, um, to actually proceed with uh, providing full access to all their titles further circumscribing the scope of access uh, for people with visual and print disabilities. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Farinaz, and thank you, panelists. Thanks very much, Sanya. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Jace Ne, who is the current CEO of Blind SA. He was also the chairperson of the African Mar Marrakesh Treaty Committee representing the African Union of the Blind and World Blind Union. Um, he has also participated in WIPO, SCCR, and Diplomatic Conference 2013 in Marrakesh. Um, he, I don't know if it's on behalf of or participated in, but the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, um, Arab Union of the Blind African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and then he has also participated in the National Assembly and the Copyright Reform Commission. And he's going to just introduce us uh, to the guide to accessible format shifting following the blind essay judgment. Over to you, Jace. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for that, uh, Madam. Ending the book famine, hashtag Braille is no crime. Blind essay and uh, Section 27 uh, developed uh, the simple guide uh, following the Constitutional Court judgment. And we are very grateful to Sanya for assisting us in putting together this guide, as well as the team at Section 27 and at Blind SA. We intend to reach out to blind and partially sighted persons policy makers, uh, activists, uh, as well as production personnel uh, to enlighten them 
on the court judgment. The purpose is to clarify and demystify the judgment uh, to answer stakeholders' questions about the judgment, to explore the limitations of the judgment, to discuss the next steps. What is in the guide? You'd find that we begin with a summary of the judgment and provide you a background of the processes that we had followed. How to convert published works into accessible formats. What is an accessible for, uh, format? Who can make uh, accessible formats? A step-by-step -step example of how to make accessible copies. And that's for university students, for individuals, for organizations or permitted entities, putting the rights of persons with disability first. And I think for us, this is quite an important chapter that highlights uh, the issues from the Bill of Rights, the limitations to the judgment, suspension of the declaration of invalidity. We highlight those aspects. The guide is available in accessible formats, uh, electronic, DAISY, Braille, large print, and print. The guide is available freely to universities, to individuals, to organizations, whoever requires the guide, including publishers, rights holders. Uh, we propose holding webinars as well as that's virtual, as well as on-site training for these groups of individuals so that they could become familiar with the court judgment. Blind essay and section 27 uh, we'll be arranging these workshops in the coming months. I'd like to thank, firstly, Section 27 and uh, Sanya for assisting us through this process. We'd also like to thank all the uh, IP activists, academics, uh, attorneys, uh, civil society, the media for the support they had given to Blind SA uh, during this process. Uh, our contact details are there. You're welcome to contact us and we can facilitate uh, the various uh, workshops either virtually or physical or you can also access uh, the guide from uh, Blind Essay and Section 27 from our website as well as from our Facebook page. I think it's a great privilege and honor for me today at this Right to Research co conference to thank Recreate and your partners for allowing us to make this presentation and more especially for us to formally launch uh, this guide. Uh, we have a print copy and a braille copy up front here for those of you who want to have a look at it. And we can forward you copies uh, should you require them. Program Director, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Jace. And you need not ask for a copy freely. You can also donate to Blind SAO Section 27. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know we're running into the lunch hour. Not just our fault, I think it's the entire program and we've uh, tried to be quite firm in sticking to time. Um, are there any questions? I just wanted to ask Sanya, 
You mentioned that that one clause said that you have to get permission first and it would, uh, in the TPM. Is there a possibility that that could be addressed in draft regulation so it doesn't stop the bill from going through, but um, that it could be addressed as a specific need um, for certain uh, users, maybe, um, and uh, put in the draft regulations? I mean, we could comment on it in the submissions, but obviously you don't want to, that to stop the whole bill going through. Um, so could it be addressed to the draft regulations? Um, good afternoon, everybody. And, um Deep appreciation to members of the panel. I also want to commend the work of um, Section 27 and Blind Essay. Uh, my question really is to ask what if there are plans, because I'm, 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 I'm seeing that from where, I st from where I'm sitting, um, Section 19D of the Copyright Amendment Bill seeks to cater for all, for persons with various, all forms of disabilities as far as um, interacting or relating with copyright protected, protected works are concerned. So it's, it, wants, it, it seeks to take the South African copyright um, regime beyond what the Marrakesh Treaty you know, provides for. So my question then is, uh, one, would, one would expect that Section 27, line they say, will you know, work to get all other disabled disability groups, if they exist, you know, in South Africa, and galvanize them towards, you know, putting a common voice to making sure that um, Parliament, uh, um, to make, making sure that that uh, Section 19D is eventually law. Are there plans in this regard? Um, the difficulty with uh, the provision that we've spotted, that's it's Section 28P, and that's an exception. So 28O criminalizes circumvention of TPMs, 28P1 uh, creates an exception, which says that um, uh, any, basically any exception or limitation, like any act in furtherance of that that circumvents the TPM is fine, subject to the conditions in 28P2. And 28P2 says, um, provides the conditions. And the first one is to apply to the copyright owner. And then the second condition says, if the copyright owner has refused such a request or fails to respond within a reasonable time, so they try to introduce a fail-safe, fails to respond in a reasonable time, then they can still go ahead and, and do it. And while on the face of it that doesn't sound too bad, the difficulty is it continues to delay. So it will, the delay will continue to exist for people with disabilities, for students, etc. cetera. Um, and then as we've seen with the court judgment, the court identifies that it is this specific requirement of applying to the copyright owner that is unfairly discriminatory. Um, so really uh, the argument would be to remove that entire subsection two, that's it. It would just be to remove subsection two because that requirement is discriminatory. Keep subsection one, which creates the exception in the first place. Um, Th that's what the argument would be. Uh, I don't think it can be fixed in regs because uh, it's a condition to, it's a condition that must be fulfilled for an exception to kick in. Um, so it forms the statutory kind of level. It, uh, regulations could only work within that. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say. So in terms of where section 27 is at, in terms of the next steps, um, I think Jay spoke a lot to the um, to the uh, uh, to this guide and us doing a little bit more education on how the guide can be useful to people with visual disabilities. Um, when we spoke earlier, we've been speaking about the limitations of this judgment. For example, on the definition of disability, the uh, uh, the, the, the case was limited to people with visual disabilities. So a lot of what we are doing going forward uh, has been on the parliamentary process around the care process. And uh, we, in our submissions, which have also been drafted by Sanya, um, we, uh, on behalf of uh, Blind SA and Section 27, uh, a lot of it is on the expansion of the definition. Uh, to include people with disabilities more generally and um, uh, also compliance with the international um, convention. So those are our immediate next steps. 
and obviously working with uh, Blind SA around developing some kind of campaign going forward to ensure that Marrakesh is uh, signed and um, ratified. Um, so those are immediate plans. Obviously, if there are other things that become apparent as we talk about uh, expanding um, access, um, then that it would be something that we would definitely be interested in exploring. Uh, but right now, we are trying to get as much leverage as we can out of the judgment in making it usable to people with visual disabilities, making sure 19, uh, making sure a cab is passed and that it's passed uh, with as broad a definition as possible and not limited to what is in the judgment. The judgment was just the baseline and we want to expand, uh, expand it as much as possible. Uh, Jace, do you want to add there? Yeah, just to, to say that uh, as Blind SA, we are part of the broader disability movement in the country and we've been working with the South African Disability Alliance uh, through this process. And I think uh, uh, both Sanya and Fernandez has highlighted that in terms of uh, the, the court's uh, definition of uh, beneficiary, I think the other disabilities are brought in there which is in line with Marrakesh. The other point that the speaker made was, remember Marrakesh uh, is not the ceiling. Marrakesh is supposed to be the floor. And it does, uh, it does not prevent uh, national governments uh, from going beyond Marrakesh. But Marrakesh should be the minimum uh, 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 that uh, the country should uh, provide for. Uh, and yes, in terms of the cab, um, Blind SA will be working with uh, Recreate and other civil society organizations in continuing the campaigns uh, through the NCOP and at the provincial legislatures. Thank you. Thanks, Chase. Um, okay, there's one more question there. Are there any more questions before we break for lunch? Mine, mine is not to, um, I do not have questions for you because um, I feel actually I should applaud you. You have done so well and so much um, under circumstances that we are facing with the um, stigma and also the um, discrimination that um, persons living with disabilities are facing in our country. Um, however, I would like to, um, because we do have um, a persons living with disability sector in um, the civil society forum. However, we have not dealt with a blind essay. Um, so mine is mainly to um, invite you guys into um, the collaborative space um, for us to um, actually move forward in um, combating all these issues and, um, you know, um, and um, see a way forward of how we can um, bring the people into breaking all these stigmas. Because I think that's, that's uh, mainly what we are um, suffering from, you know, lack of knowledge um, and making people aware and understand that um, as human beings, we do have the right to knowledge and what kind of knowledge is out there for us. Thank you so much. Uh, I loved something that was said at the beginning of this panel, which is that this was a unique partnership because usually the lawyers are the ones who are doing the teaching. And so I'd love to hear from your personal experiences how flipping or reversing that situation maybe helped you challenge your own preconceived notions or maybe tactics and approaches that you otherwise would have used. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? I think usually in the space of activism, I see that individual groups have a certain way that a certain approach already in mind that they that they have seen has worked before for them or that they think will just be very effective in this particular context. But when it's a partnership, of course, there's multiple organizations that have a chance to influence what those tactics are going to look like. And because you said Blind SA had very strong opinions, I'd love to know how they maybe changed what that strategy looked like in the end. Um, do you have anything to say, Jace? Uh, yes, I think it's uh, firstly as Blind SA and uh, the leadership 
within blind SA. I think we are very uh, cognizant because we have a lived experience uh, of the issues that we were raising, uh, not only on behalf of our beneficiaries, but we ourselves have uh, lived through that. And therefore, we were, I think, uh, were fortunate in having expertise, having uh, experience from within our sector to help guide and mold us uh, into some of the actions that we would uh, want to take. But we were also very mindful that we do not live in a ghetto and that we live in a broader society and that we need to collaborate and we need to partner and we also need to understand the perspectives of non-visually uh, impaired persons. And therefore, we are very uh, open and uh, encourage uh, collaboration. And we always look forward to someone trying to convince us otherwise, because that's the way we would be able to broaden our horizons and be able to learn better, I think. So I think from our side, we don't have any inhibitions. We, we just like to work and work with everyone that can help us to achieve what we believe uh, are the right things to do. Thanks. So to just say that one of the main criticisms of, there are criticisms, criticisms of public interest law, whether it's uh, the limitations of public interest law um, or how lawyers work. Um, and one of the things that they often say as a criticism of public interest law or movement lawyering is that lawyers uh, tend to drive uh, campaigns and they try to drive legal strategy um, rather than taking uh, direction from the people that we purport to serve um, and that we have a broader interest in creating the jurisprudence and, and all of that. Um, and to have an equality uh, an equal relationship between the client and the lawyer is something that's very rare. Um, I think as we mature as public interest lawyers in this country and we become live to um, some, some of these kinds of criticisms and what's often happened as well is for example, in our textbook case, one of the criticisms was that Section 27 was, for example, very involved in the establishment of the organization that became the client in the case. Um, this was not the situation here. So as, 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 as JC is saying, there's very much a lived experience that is not within our knowledge. Um, and as we said when Claudia was speaking, you know, having, ha if we had sight of her paper, it should have informed a lot of our understanding of what is a reproduction, what is an adaptation, and all of that. So there is that that's brought to the table. Um, and um, how we work on a legal strategy is also determined by the constraints of the law, but it's also where you have such strong clients who know where they are going at the outset and who know what they want. It's very much uh, a partnership and an interaction in terms of negotiating what is the legal strategy, what is the end goal, and how do we get there. And I must say, in terms of this, um, we, uh, we've joked and we've called uh, Jace in them the blind mafia. And we've also uh, joked and said we, we don't, we've often had to say, Jace, we don't just uh, 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 represent you guys, but we have a whole kind of uh, community of education rights that we have to also uh, be alive to. So yeah, I mean, in that sense, um, you know, we're dealing with an empowered client. And you don't always deal with empowered clients. So in that, it's also been very exciting. Um, there have been cases where there have been 
including with Section 27, uh, where, where, where there are often very um, strong debates about legal strategy. Um, and I think there's a paper written by people in equal education about some of the debates that have happened around some of the education stuff. Um, that didn't happen here, uh, but those debates do happen. Um, and it's very much part of the whole movement lawyering thing about how you navigate and mediate those um, uh, 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 confrontations or disagreements or whatever. But here yeah, it was very much um, a relationship of equals and also, you know, often there are things where um, the lawyers then tend to take uh, the, the, the stage in dealing with the media and all of that. For us, it's actually been such a pleasure that uh, we didn't have to do that in this case and that Blind SA are as media savvy as we are, if not more. They know what they want to say and it's not us um, uh, doing it. We work on our press briefing, our press statements together, for example, and there'd be a designated person in Section 27, but there'd also be a designated group of people um, within uh, Blind SA. And uh, more than us, they are taking um, front and center when it comes to speaking to a case that's more relevant to them. Um, and obviously where it's legalese, then we would do that. But um, yeah, that's, that's how it's worked. The meaning of a message is not in how it's delivered, whether it's read or heard or felt. What matters is not how we write it or how we send it, but rather that we can. Donate now to help give someone's words wings.